Good afternoon, you're watching Media Live from the News Hub. I am Porsche Gabo. Coming up, the headlines. Chamber of Petroleum Consumers kicks against fuel price increase. Also coming up, Bureau of Public Safety warns against arming MTTD officers. Coming up in international news, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson threatens to expel rebel lawmakers from Conservative Party. We have details coming up shortly and in our very first story, the Director General of the Police Public Affairs Directorate, ACP David Senano Eklu, says the Police Management Board will meet to determine how to implement a directive from the Interior Minister for personnel of the MTTD to be armed. In the ACP. You see, normally if we take the Kaswa incident, I, I cannot recall it, maybe when an MTU officer was shot at in doing his work. And traditionally, MTU officers or traffic officers, police officers all over the world are not armed. Uh -huh. uh, but the, the Kasua case has given us an education uh -huh. that we need to review right. what we are doing and maybe step up the protection for officers performing traffic duties. So the modalities we worked out, if MTU officers start carrying the AK-47, which is the commonest weapon that we use for our work. It becomes very clumsy. But there are other ways that uh, we look at it in a way that the protection that they will need to do their work will be increased without necessarily giving them heavy arms. Mm. Yeah, so those are the modalities that I believe from next week. Sure. Um, police management board will look at it right. and see how we can implement it. Meanwhile, the Bureau of Public Safety is calling on the Police Council not to arm Police Motor Transport and Traffic Directorate MTTD officers pending their retraining and sensitization. In a statement, the Bureau argued that arming the MTTD personnel without first equipping them with their requisite soft skills will heighten police citizens' tensions. The Bureau rather wants the police to develop a strict protocol for engaging citizens in various scenarios. The Bureau of Public Safety added the retraining of police personnel with needed soft skills is crucial to preventing or reducing escalated conflicts that may lead to injuries and loss of lives. It noted further that all police personnel should be equipped with the basic policing equipment such as radio bulletproof vest, a less lethal tool and a lethal tool that a pistol. And the issue of extending service contracts of retired public officials has dominated media discussions in recent times and under the amendment amended Article 199 of Ghana's 1992 Constitution, the President has the power to extend the service contract of retiring officers by two to five years. The Ashanti Regional Chairman of the NPP, Bernard Nchubwe Seako, believes the clause has done more harm to the police service than probably any other public institution. He spoke with William Evans Sinkum. Known as Chairman Wuntme and we are going to talk about issues of politics and of course we also delve into the issues of police brutalities and fatalities if you talk about what has happened now or what is happening now as a citizen and as a chairman and as a politician uh, I, I'm, I'm not happy i'm not happy at all you know the reasoning is that you know uh, for how long can we keep on you know, uh, uh, having sympathy for uh, police people, uh, giving contract to police people who retire. You know, giving contract to 
police people who retire, uh, you know, it's not a problem. But now it become a problem when Apia too did not do his job properly. When things are no good, all of us have to come together to say, no, this one is no good. Because of what Apia too didn't do it well, you know, to me personally, uh, I know that uh, uh, IGP, current uh, acting IGP, is trying to do his best. But because his successor, you know, did not do what he, he would have done, now there is, a, there is a big hole. That is why now they are killing the police people. The armed robbers can see the police for the police to start fleeing, to flee, and then they shoot them. And interior minister will give order that they have to wear, uh, what do you call it, uh, bulletproof and, and carry guns. Are we at war? Let's go back to our earlier story on the need to arm personnel of the MTTD. Let's speak to Adam Bona. He is a security analyst. And thanks so much for your time, Adam. Hello, Mr. Bona. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Now, the decision to arm personnel of the MTT, did you see this as a needful thing to do or just a knee-jerk reaction? Uh, well, uh, arming the MTT, they say, is not a challenge. But are they adequately prepared to be armed? These are the questions we should be asking. First of all, uh, there are certain fundamentals that must be put in right. Uh, Training. We need to train them. Do they have the requisite training to use firearms? And uh, why this issue about arming them? What what informed it? Is it because uh, two MTTD officers have been shot and killed, which is very unfortunate. For me, arming them is not the solution. Rather, let's look at uh, training them adequately to be able to deal with civilians. But arming them, for me... Uh, Everywhere you go, uh, you see police officers who are, you know, some police officers are armed with sidearms. Uh, but in our case, are we talking about arming them with AK 47s? And uh, what training are we giving them to deal with civilians on our streets? Mm. If that training is not there, then it is, it, is, uh, it, is, it is needless to arm them. It is completely needless to arm them. We are not uh, probably in a banana republic. I just think that we need to slow down and uh, take, take our steps slowly, think through what we are doing, mm -hmm. instead of uh, being reactive. This is what I can say. If arming them is not the solution, what then needs to be done? I think that's your question. If arming them is not the solution, what needs to be done then? Well, what, what needs to be done is to train them. Most, most, most of our police officers are not properly trained. It is, it's a fact out there. A police officer will stop a driver, and you ask the driver, you ask the police question, a uh, yeah, police uh, officer a question, and sometimes they are angry. Some of them are angry, and if you are not careful, they will slap you immediately. And so we need to train them, make sure that they are adequately equipped to, with, in terms of human skills. They, most of them lack, lack what I call the soft skills in dealing with humans, and that is more injurious to they themselves and also to civilians. And so arming them uh, won't be the way to go. Let's put in all the measures. As we speak, the police MTTD doesn't even have MTTD training school. And so if you are a, tra a traffic officer, which training school did you go to? Or you went to police depot to train as a, what do you call it, as a traffic officer? These are specialized institutions. If you go to Britain, they have the transport police with a transport training police, uh, what do you call a school? Most countries have it. And so we just can't start jumping when we really have not crawled. And so we need to be careful with some of the decisions uh, we make. Mm. As we speak now, this directive has already been given. Do you think the Interior Ministry should take um, a halt? Well, I think they, they, they would have to take a second look at that directive because this directive is going to make a lot of people Already, Ghanaians are arming. People are arming themselves. And so, saying that TTV officers also should be armed mm. won't help. And so, I think they should take a second look at that directive and rather look at how they can improve upon the skills of 
uh, FGTV officers instead of arming them. I think that would not help. They should, they should respect that decision to uh, arm FGTV officers. That is not the way to go, not at all. Thank you very much for your time. I've been speaking to Adam Bona. He is a security analyst as well as CEO of Security Warehouse. You're still watching Media Live from the News Hub. In other news, the LI to the Mental Health Act was passed and has been effective since July 19. But without the establishment of the special levy, the Chief Executive Officer of the Mental Health Authority, Dr. Kwisose, says the authority is engaging the Minister of Finance on this. He's hopeful the levy will be established by the end of the year, a report by Wendy Lai. Funding for mental health care in Ghana is poor. The Mental Health Acts and the LI are seen as a solution to the mental health funding gap. The special levy is to ensure adequate funding. The way forward is that we will now go and engage with the Minister for Finance and see how that should be established. And I'm sure that a lot of advocates will need to go in. But that is, that, is, that is a stage. So it's not like they deliberately left it out, but the argument was that it is not for them, it's not for parliament to establish levy. That is for the executive, Minister of Finance. Mental illness is associated with high levels of health service utilization and associated cost. The few resources devoted to mental health care by government are largely allocated to the psychiatric hospitals. By law, once the law provides for a mental health fund, it means the fund exists. But it remains an empty port because the Ministry of Finance has not given budgetary allocation into that port. Really now put those funds into the mental health fund for it to be used to develop a mental health care in Ghana. Other viable options to support mental health funding include the NHIS. In the past, NHI was not inclined towards accommodating mental health because one, fundamentally, the law itself excludes mental health care from it. And two, they were also anxious that if he came on board, we would overburden the scheme. But now there's a certain shift in their appreciation, so they are accommodating. Eventually, we want the NHIS to cover operational costs. At a forum to discuss mental health funding in Ghana, speakers outlined the current mental health funding situation, options for increasing budgetary allocation, ensuring effective inclusion of persons with mental illness in social protection schemes, and mental health financing in the context of free mental health care. The issue of how do we finance mental health how do we finance our health in the Ghana Beyond Eat environment? It's something that is quite important. In 2018, government budgetary allocation to mental health care was 0.8% of the total health budget. Its allocation in 2019 was increased to 1.1%. Let's go to the Volta region where residents of Kodukopa, a farming community in the North Town district, are calling for the provision of a pipe borne water. And Joseph Armstrong reports residents also want a landing site constructed. Residents of Todokope visit the riverside every day to wash, after which they fetch some home for drinking and cooking. <laughs> Adults and children who visit the riverside risk being carried away due to the lack of proper landing site. Whenever we, we want to fetch water, we can never pass the place. The place will be slippery. Whenever our, our mothers are coming from the overbank for farming, they cannot even pass it. Whenever it rains, they can't even pass it. So we are praying for the government to make the place for us. Previously, this was not how this place was. But now, it is even difficult coming here to fetch water for drinking. Residents say they are fortunate compared to other communities living miles away from the river who also lack pipe-borne water. Their only challenge is the absence of a landing site at the riverside. The river separates about 16 communities in the North Thong municipality. Farming and other economic activities thrive on both sides of the river. The sick are also transported across the river to Bato Hospital. However, residents have to wait for hours for the river to recede to enable them land at the riverside. 
Residents admit it can be dangerous. The North Thong Municipal Assembly says it is aware of the problem and it is in consultation with developing partners to find a lasting solution to the problem. Residents, however, complain economic activities is affected anytime the river overflows. Joseph Armstrong, TV3 News, Tudu Kopi. Away from the Volta region, poor telecommunication signal is hampering communication at Kwewu, a farming community in the Nchiawin municipality of the Western North region, and residents queue at a particular location in the middle of the community to make calls. Joseph Armstrong was in the community and has filed this report. The residents of Kwewu are mostly farmers. Telecommunication signals are poor for over 600 residents. A particular location, however, provides a relief. Hello, Ahmed. Hey, I'm here. I'm here, old man Gaddafi. Hey, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, no, 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 it is the only point one can make and receive call. A resident climb an electric pole just to make call. Challenges in making and receiving calls is not their only worry. In February this year, Minister for Communication, S. Laosue Kufu, said as part of the strategies to ensure universal access, Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communications, GIFEC, will be implementing the Rural Telephoning Project. The rural telephoning project is intended to extend coverage of mobile services into areas where access to such services is not adequately available due to unwillingness or inability of mobile network operators to extend their networks as a result of commercial or other considerations. Meanwhile, rules linking Kuwu to other adjoining communities are unmotorable. Community leaders told TV3 some teachers have refused posting to the community due to these challenges. We don't have network here. We have reported this several times, but we are yet to get help. This is making it difficult for us in transacting business. Leaders have called on authorities to work at improving infrastructure in the area. Joseph Armstrong, TV3 News, Kweu, Western North. Let's now focus on education and authorities at the Nana Brain to Senior High School in the Awin Enchi municipality have called for the completion of abandoned projects to improve teaching and learning. Joseph Armstrong reports students study in a dilapidated wooden structure. The Nana Brain to Senior High School was established in the early 90s. The school currently has a student population of over 1,200. The school also has a teaching and non-teaching staff of 57. Despite the huge numbers, the school lacks the needed facilities to deal with the large numbers. As at the time of filing this report, only first-year students were on campus. This is where students of the Nabrin Tum Senior High Technical School use as their classroom every day. The same place is used as the assembly hall, the same place also used as their dining hall and then assembly centre. This is not because they do not have a classroom block. They have a fine 12-unit classroom block that in 2012 was said to have developed some cracks. A 12-unit classroom project started during President Kufo's regime was used by the student until it developed cracks some years after its completion. It was later awarded to a contractor for rehabilitation works to be undertaken. However, since 2012, the contractor is yet to finish fixing the cracks. Another building made up of more than six-unit classrooms started under the reign of former President Mills has been abandoned. Work of a two-story building project meant to be used as a boarding facility started during the reign of President Mahama has also stalled. With all this project not completed, a wooden structure is being used as classroom. The students, teachers have appealed to authorities to complete the project to improve teaching and learning in the school. This wooden structure, there is no covering things like doors and windows. So all the time when we come here for social gathering you see the animals will also be coming and they have been defecating here and there when they come to we have to get up and suck them away if we are studying it's very difficult to combine the whole class and when the, when the students are many we cannot even identify that this person is have a problem 
this person is good or this person is no good. Darwin Enchi, educational director, Sebastian Deu is also sad about the infrastructure challenge of the school. We cannot do anything. We can only support them maybe through appointment of teaching staff and all those things. But in terms of the infrastructure over there, that is the responsibility of the government and the uh, 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 district assembly. Which Municipal Chief Executive of Awain, Samuel Edu Jemfi, said government has paid all the contractors to complete the project. All those who are working on secondary school sites have been paid to complete their job because come September, most of the schools will not go uh, uh, double track unless maybe some key schools that have thickly populated I mean, enrollment. Mm -hmm. I have been chasing these contractors who are within their area. And very fortunately for me, I have 41 secondary schools. Yeah. You see, unfortunately, the population is also large. He engaged with one of the contractors in a phone conversation who indeed confirmed receiving full payment from Get Fund. Yeah, he said contractors have been paid, those who are working on their projects at the secondary school. Well, what happened was that the payment came too long. So when he came, well, when the payment came, the bank has taken all the money, almost all the money. That, that is the, that the municipal chief executive, however, promised to have the project completed as soon as possible. Joseph Armstrong, TV3 News. Coming up as the MTN video report, and today our citizen journalist Albert Viapa highlights the poor state of classrooms at Mafi Wudupo in the Volta region. Is the state of Mafiwudupu the ESS? This is form one to form three cl classroom. It is very, very appalling. We are appealing to the government of Ghana to come to our aid. Mafiwudupu in the central town district, Fota region, Ghana, reporting for TV3 MTN video report. Albert Yafe. You can also send your video report via WhatsApp on the number 055-143-3044. You're still watching Middle Live from the News Hub. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. Hello again, it's now time for business news. A recent report released by the Bank of Ghana has placed mobile banking as the number one mode of payments in the country. The report, which is the latest Payment Systems Oversight Annual Report 2018, was released this week by the Bank of Ghana. The report shows that mobile money transactions and mobile banking services grew in both volume and value, while other payment platforms such as checks, cards and internet banking either saw declines in volume or value or both, or at best grew marginally. Check code line clearing CCC, one of the numerous parts of payment, saw a negative change with the report noting that the total volume of interbank checks cleared in 2018 declined by 1.1%. The value of transactions, however, went up by 13.3%. In mobile banking, on value of transactions, there was a huge jump of 276.88% to 5.6 billion in 2018 from 1.5 billion. Ghanaians say they choose to use mobile banking due to its relative flexibility. I would recommend mobile banking than getting to the banking hall where uh, they waste your time and the rest. Mobile banking helps a lot quick. You get your money, whatever you want to do, you can transact business very fast. Mobile banking is more accessible and easy in terms of um, making the little, little transaction. In a situation where you need to, you know, transfer money to somebody in a area where there's no bank available it's very easy to do that on on the on the mobile money the report noted financial technology companies played a significant role in the payment ecosystem in the areas of product development delivery channels data analytics data management technology support and systems development
In other news, the implementation of taxes announced in the supplementary budget has taken effect. The tax increases, which took effect Sunday, September 1, has increased pump prices. The Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, in a statement signed by its Executive Secretary, Duncan Amwa, said the increase in fuel taxes is ill-timed, ill-advised and completely insensitive. COPEC says this will have repercussions on the country, adding it will far outweigh any benefits anticipated from the increases. COPEC is demanding an immediate reversal and withdrawal of the hikes in order to make way for further dialogue on the current fuel price build-up with a view to reversing the recent unfortunate trend of persistent increases. Let's speak to Duncan Amwa. He is the Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC. And thanks for your time, Duncan. So you want dialogue on the build-up of fuel prices, but one component is the toll recovery level, which consumers have been paying for over 10 years. Now, how crucial is it for the dialogue at this point in time? Things are getting really out of hand as far as fuel pricing in Ghana is concerned. Uh, it cannot be a wishy-washy situation uh, that we only talk about these things and then uh, the political class will get away with anything at all that they wish because it is easier to collect. Uh, if you recall, even at uh, 16, Ghanaians had a lot of complaints. At 20, we've complained. At 23, uh, we are still being told that the taxes would have to go up. Uh, one will be forced to ask, is there no alternate revenue uh, stream source that government could have targeted to rake in additional revenue? Mm -hmm. Indeed, there are quite a number of alternate stream sources which the government seems to be closing an, an eye to and rather coming back uh, to pile up pressure into the, Ghan the, the pockets of Ghanaian and uh, general hardships uh, expected to increase mm -hmm. as a whole due to these increases that uh, we are currently seeing. So we are saying the government should look at alternate uh, income sources and ensure that uh, it goes in to close whatever uh, illegal avenues exist for the fuel smuggling syndicates uh, who are known uh, to be costing all of us about 1.6 billion cities every single year uh, as far as uh, smuggling fuel into the country and selling same our content. We will be quite surprising the government goes ahead uh, with, with this uh, hardship that uh, this fuel taxes are going to uh, pile on ordinary Ghanaians. Now you've described this move as ill-timed, ill-advised and insensitive. Now you want a reversal of this move. Um, how do you intend to achieve this? Um, we believe the government would be uh, magnanimous to the various uh, communique or various correspondence that uh, we are sent to it. Uh, we would want to believe that the government will also be sensitive to the plight of Ghanaians and understand what increasing fuel prices uh, to the ordinary pocket uh, means. If all the dialogue avenues fail, if all other avenues to uh, get any redress from uh, government fail, uh, we will be forced to embark on a series of demonstrations together with the drivers, together with ordinary Ghanaians who come uh, to complain morning, afternoon and evening. Uh, we would be embarking on a series of demonstrations across the country. Mm. And we are quite sure that uh, the government may want to listen to us, at least now, uh, before we get such a heated point. Thank you very much for your time. And Duncan Amwa is the Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers. You're still watching Media Live from the News Hub. In other news, management of the Tema Regional Office of PDS say all is set to begin replacing the old prepaid meters with a smart metering system. A total of 45,000 smart prepaid meters would be installed in the entire Tema Township by the close of the year. The South District covers communities in Tema, Nungwa, Ada, and Environs. PDS says the installation has become necessary having used the old prepaid meters and encountered several challenges. The Tema PDS team, as part of the project installation, had a stakeholders' engagement with all assembly members in the district. 
The project is expected to be rolled out by September this year. The South District Manager of PDS, Cynthia Bannerman, said the exercise will be done in phases. The metering system we are using for now is associated with a myriad of challenges. Some customers misplacing their carts. Sometimes the carts become faulty. And we also have this challenge of energy theft. So as a way of enhancing customer convenience, we have the smart solution. She asks residents to collaborate with the team. The moment you purchase the power from the vendor, automatically the power is sent into your meter. So it minimizes even the human involvement. Everything is remotely controlled. One of the assembly members spoke to TV3 News. This exercise is a laudable one, if compared to the other one, where sometimes if you come to the office and then you buy a credit and then the system says you have to go back to the house and then slot the machine before coming back. This uh, meter is going to take care of that one. To so some international business news, and Argentina has imposed currency controls in the attempt to stabilize markets as the country faces a deepening financial crisis. The government will restrict foreign currency purchases following a sharp drop in the value of the peso. Firms will have to seek central bank permission to sell pesos to buy foreign currency and to make transfers abroad. Argentina is also seeking to defer debt payments to the International Monetary Fund (IMF) to deal with the crisis. In an official bulletin issued on Sunday, the government said that it was necessary to adopt a series of extraordinary measures to ensure the normal functioning of the economy, to sustain the level of activity and employment, and also to protect consumers. The central bank said the measures were intended to maintain currency stability. That's it for the latest in the world of business. We have sports news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. In more news this afternoon, a 10-year-old boy, Nanaya Abuafo, is reported missing and he left home by 7 a.m. on Saturday and has since not returned to his parents. Nanaya speaks tree fluently and is a student of the Omenako Methodist Basic School near Suhum in the eastern region. And anyone who has information on his whereabouts should please contact the nearest police station or call 020 nine seven five eight two three five again zero two zero nine seven five eight two three five In other news, the Ayalolo bus system, which halted operations last year, October, has finally resumed operations today. And new reforms have also been introduced to ensure its sustenance. And Ajwa Dubiosu has been interacting with the public relations officer of the Greater Accra Passenger Transport Executive, Fred Chidi, on the new reforms. Quality bus system, popularly known as Ayalolo, halted operations a few months ago due to lack of funds and designated routes. The buses are expected to start operation today because there have been new reforms. I'm here to speak with the public relations officer of the Greater Accra Passenger Transport Executive, Fred Chidi, to tell me more about these new reforms and uh, how operations have been so far since they started. Today, the 2nd of September, uh, I am happy to announce that we have started the Adenta um, Accra CBD service. Uh, we started early this morning at about 5 o'clock. The first bus took off uh, from this terminal and then went down to the Adenta housing area and then moved on to Accra. It was followed by five other buses. So today alone, we started with six buses. 
we are going to escalate it as and when demand grows and so we anticipate that by the close of this month we probably would have been doing about 25 to 30 buses so what we are trying to do with the limited morning and evening peak service is to move the buses from uh, the point of origin to the central business district and then in the evening go back so the uh, the tendency in the past where you will see the buses rolling every 10 minutes will not be the case now besides in this initial phase we've introduced a um, paper ticket there are some people who started loading cash on the carts they were using yes. what happens to these people at this point in time Ab absolutely those people will be on the amasaman to do corridor and what we have done when we came back on on that uh, corridor was to allow them to use their cards. So most of them, I, I mean, I believe everybody may have exhausted their cards as we speak right now. Those who have not exhausted it probably did not get on board Ayalulu again. But if you have, you would have exhausted it. But nevertheless, if you still have it, um, we encourage you to use it. Talking of the designated routes, is that now properly done? No, um, as a matter of fact, on the Adenta Accra CBD, we do not have dedicated lanes as we speak. There have been some studies done on the corridor. Up next is entertainment news. And creativity, style, and originality came to play as contestants of Ghana's Most Beautiful stunned the audience with a mind-blowing fashion night and Bono is representative Pena won three awards. Start to hush. One forward three is a short code as well. Posture, composure, and attitude was the talk of the night as the ladies rocked the runway. Closed in three different looks, creativity and style came to play. Described as a colorful night of creative designs, the night of glitz and glamour was also characterized by an array of music and dance. There's a bit of fat. I see eggshells. I see fugu. Even though judges had a few issues with some of the designs, most of them made quite a good impression. In a variety of designs displayed, Bono East Regional Rep Pena, clothed by Dash Fashion, walked home with three awards. Pena wins this one too! Oh yeah! Pena's well-designed oh, yeah. outfits were adjudged best indigenous and national wear, while her designer, Dash Fashions, was adjudged the best designer for the night. Congratulations to Dash Fashion. I said to myself that whatever she brings, I'll go on stage and nail it. You know, when you're wearing something good, you get this vigor, you know, to rock it. So that was what was going through my mind. I said to myself, I'm wearing something amazing. So why, why can't I showcase it well for people to know that my designer is very good? Anytime I pick a GTP print, I'm inspired by the designs. And I don't want to do much... I just want to play with the motifs in the print and that's what I did for my contestant because she already has the African shape. All I have to do is make sure that I just, uh, yeah, and then we are done. The overall star model was awarded to Aisha, the Upper East Regional Rep, closed by Rider One. I took it as a fun day for me, so I was just excited on the stage and I was doing my thing. Cut work is something I really love doing, so I just want to say thank you to my fans and to the judges and to Ghana, especially the Upper East Region, for supporting me and helping me to win this. It's part of many, many, many surprises. I'm going to keep doing my best, and I know that my best will yield good results. So. Join us again next week, Sunday, for another edition of Ghana's Most Beautiful. And that's it for Midday Life. Thanks so much for your time. I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon.